Professor.
make sure. You know what? I just want to control. shut this. Okay, got it. You can put them up.
try to go ahead and get started. This might be a record South Asia program starting almost on time. Exactly. Uh, so thank you all for joining us here today. Um, we at the Stimson Center have been thinking a lot about sort of evolving strategy, doctrine, uh, and stability issues in Southern Asia. And by that, we mean not just India and Pakistan, but also uh, the balance of India and China and China's role in, in South Asia as a whole. I think we're seeing a lot of major developments taking place over the past, uh, certainly in the last year even. Uh, you see a lot of discussions and sort of actual uh, progress in terms of military modernization, uh, missile tests. Um, they seem to be happening sort of every few months. Uh, certainly heightened discussion of doctrine, uh, and certainly these new patterns of alliances or alignments that are either deepening or, or, or uh, hardening in certain ways. And, um, and then also, as we're seeing in an ongoing sort of dispute right now with India and China, you're, you're seeing more friction points, direct exchanges of, of fire, at least on sort of the, the Indian Pakistani line of control, uh, or sort of tensions over terrorism, or, or standoffs, as we're seeing today in India and China. So uh, to, that's, that's a very useful backdrop for this discussion, which prompted us to sort of put this uh, event together. Uh, and then today, it's quite fortuitous that the, the New York Times has this, uh, uh, this column called The Interpreter. Uh, and in this newsletter they sent out today, they actually mentioned an article that's uh, of great sort of relevance to the discussion today. So they reference an article that's published by uh, two uh, other MIT-trained scholars, Brendan Green and Austin Long, who have also written work uh, for the Simpson Center, um, basically so challenging the idea that either the US or Soviet Union actually accepted mutually assured, assured destruction during the Cold War. And that, in fact, what they were doing was perpetually trying to uh, look for escalatory or counterforce strategies that allow them to escape mutually assured destruction. And I think this sort of, maybe not necessarily revisionist history, but this, uh, this new approach to thinking about how at least the two competitors and two rivals during the Cold War thought about this problem might help us understand what's, what's happening today in South Asia, where uh, we're seeing states that might not be actually just be comfortable with nuclear sufficiency uh, and actually are, are, are quite motivated to keep competing, uh, even if they have a, a robust sort of second strike capability. So uh, to discuss some of these issues and discuss evolutions and strategic doctrine in South Asia, we have three great speakers who will be talking uh, about some of the changes that we're observing, some of the causes of this, and potential implications <laughs> Uh, for deterrence and stability in the region. Uh, and so we will. We have, uh, to my left, this is my left, yeah, stage left, okay. I get it now. Uh, Vipin Narang, who is an associate professor of political science at MIT, and as of July 1st, is fully tenured at MIT. Uh, he's been a, yeah, cheers. We'll toast after. Uh, he's been a Stanton Junior Faculty Fellow at Stanford University's CSAC as the author of Nuclear Strategy in the Modern Era, which won the 2015 ISA uh, International Security Studies Section Best Book Award. And he's currently working on a second book uh, titled, tentatively titled Strategies of Nuclear Proliferation. Uh, to my right, immediate right, is uh, Brigadier Feroz Hassan Khan, who's a lecturer at the Naval Postgraduate School and a former brigadier in the Pakistan Army. He has served as the Director of Arms Control and Disarmament Affairs in Pakistan's Strategic Plans Division and is the author of uh, a well-known book, uh, probably the authoritative book on Pakistan's bomb, uh, Eating Grass, The Making of the Pakistani Bomb. And finally, to my far right, Michael Crapon, co-founded the Stimson Center in 1989. I didn't even realize it was that old, wow. Uh, where he served as the Stimson's president and CEO until 2000. He uh, was appointed University of Virginia's diplomat scholar, where he taught from 2001 to 2010. Uh, he's the author of 20-something books and counting, uh, including most recently the lure and pitfalls of MIRBs from the first to the second nuclear age. And so we have a star-studded panel. We're going to spend about maybe 10 to 15 minutes per speaker uh, with some opening remarks and provocations. Uh, and from there, we'll uh, take it to uh, probably what I imagine will be a lively question and answer session. So with that, we'll start off with Bippin. Great. Thanks, Samir. Thanks, Michael. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at Stimson, um, which is very supportive early on in my career. Uh, and what Samir didn't mention is uh, I have the, uh, I was lucky to be on his dissertation committee. So Stimson is you know, kind of part of the family in a lot of ways, and it's uh, a real pleasure to be back here. Um, and I'm going to talk, I'm going to give the, the sequel today. Um, I gave a short presentation 
on this topic at the Carnegie Nuclear Policy Conference in March. Uh, and it kind of literally blew up. Uh, and everybody focused on, uh, and the takeaway from that talk was, oh, India has changed its nuclear doctrine and no longer abides by no first use, which was not actually the point of the talk, and I never said that. But the Indian media decided to run with that, and everything kind of uh, ended up shifting into whether India had abandoned no first use. Let me reiterate, India has not changed its doctrine. It almost certainly will not change its doctrine. India will continue, it, it is my bet, will continue to have a declared no first use doctrine. Uh, but there are changes afoot. Uh, and the substantive point of uh, my uh, remarks at the Carnegie conference were that there was uh, authoritative thinking by a former national security advisor, Shiv Shankar Menon, on Indian sh uh, consideration about Indian th moving towards counterforce targeting. It was long presumed that India had a countervalue targeting strategy, credible minimum deterrence, large strategic weapons it would use in retaliation. Uh, but there were tantalizing hints in his Brookings 2016 book uh, called Choices uh, that were kind of consistent with some of the technological developments we've been seeing that India might not be content with countervalue retaliation uh, as its only targeting strategy. And it may think about uh, shifting to or including in its option, in its menu of options, uh, counterforce targeting strategy. So what I'm going to do today really quickly is talk about the strategic logic for why India might be thinking about this, the evolution of the strategic dynamic between India and Pakistan, and why uh, when Menon was national security advisor, there may have been incentives to think about <laughs> creating counterforce options to dis, uh, disarm Pakistan's strategic nuclear weapons force. Uh, and then I'll present the evidence with significant caveats that this is Menon's thinking. Um, and we can t talk about whether it's persisted, whether we think it's persisted, what other indicators we have. Uh, and the take home uh, point is that you can't ignore that a former national security advisor has written this. India does not talk about its nuclear doctrine very often. There's only one public nuclear doctrine from 2003, which is now all, you know, almost 15 years old. Uh, and uh, when you see authoritative thinking and writing by a national security advisor, the point person in the Indian system managing nuclear strategy, it's important. Uh, and so we can't discount what he writes or what he may uh, suggest is uh, a debate that was ongoing when at least he was national security advisor. But the important piece initially is the strategic logic for why India might be thinking about counterforce options. So we'll start with some basic theory, the nuclear revolution. The nuclear revolution is very simple in some ways, easily stated as mutually accepted nuclear vulnerability leads to high levels of strategic stability. And that's a very specific condition, right? So you have to have secure second strike forces. Both sides have to accept mutual vulnerability. And at that point in a nuclear dyad that in which mutually accepted nuclear vulnerability exists, nuclear use is suicidal. And so you get high levels of strategic stability. All this means, according to the nuclear revolution, is that you will not have strategic nuclear exchange. The core assumptions of the nuclear revolution are twofold. The first is that mutual vulnerability is impossible to escape. Once you achieve this condition of secure second strike forces, high levels of survivability, it is too costly to escape it. The New York Times article today and Long and Green's work suggests that the, you know, there was this belief uh, that it was just too costly to threaten the survivability of Soviet or American strategic nuclear forces, particularly once they went to sea, uh, because the offensive advantage, decoys, uh, cheap survivability measures, are more cost effective than threatening survivability. So threatening survivability is harder than ensuring survivability, right? So that's the core assumption, one of the core assumptions of the nuclear revolution. And the second one, which is related especially to South Asia now, is the so-called stability and stability paradox. The states are willing to trade high levels of stability for low levels of instability, right? So it says, okay, well, we're gonna have high levels of strategic nuclear stability, but that frees us up again to have low-level conflict, full-scale war, 
Glenn Snyder and his formulation of the uh, st uh, st uh, stability and stability paradox talked about even tactical nuclear use. You could have tactical nuclear use, and you know that would be a war terminating event because strategic nuclear exchange was still suicidal under a condition of mutually assured destruction. There are a couple of things, however, and Michael can talk about the Cold War dynamic and you know, related to what Samir was talking about with the US and the Soviet Union, both trying to kind of escape this condition. Right? This condition basically says you can only have counter value targeting strategies. Anything short of that is a waste of money. And why would you threaten this high level of stability? Well, it turns out the US and Soviet Union were both kind of interested in escaping this condition so that they could win a war, including a nuclear war. But now increasingly, in the case of India at least, is it possible to escape mutual vulnerability? Threatening survivability may not be so expensive. ISR is becoming cheaper. Pakistan has only tens of strategic nuclear forces, not tens of thousands. So the problem is not as hard as the Soviet Union. The bigger incentive, I think, whoops, for the Indian case is this question about how much instability are you willing to tolerate? The United States did not have to accept uh, terrorism in its metropoles believed to be sponsored by the adversary. The low level instability that the Cold War was concerned about was in Germany. India is being attacked in its metropoles by terrorists that believes are being sponsored by or funded by and coming from Pakistan. At some point, that becomes untenable. How much revisionism are you willing to accept? How much instability are you willing to accept? The second thing is the horizon of the future. Again, something that the US really didn't have to concern itself with, although some Sovietologists did. Who's going to control the nuclear forces in Pakistan in the future? Right now, it's under army control. But in the future, maybe there is domestic political instability. And the future control of Pakistan's nuclear weapons uh, is may, you know, you may worry that it falls into extremist hands. You may have to have this arrow in your quiver to disarm their strategic nuclear weapons because of both of these conditions. You may not know who controls their nuclear weapons in the future and how much instability you're willing to accept before you start saying enough is enough. And this umbrella under which India believes Pakistan is aggressing needs to be removed. So uh, long and green talk about the United States, and Michael will probably talk about this more in the future. Right? So we always thought the US is just the outlier. And extended deterrence is a big piece of that. We can talk about that later. But I'm going to present some of Menon's thinking about counterforce, which suggests that, well, you know, why would India be concerned about this? Why would India be incentivized to do this? So the Indian belief over the past you know, 14, 15 years has been that Pakistan uses nuclear, almost 20 years now actually, the, that Pakistan uses nuclear weapons as a shield behind which to aggress. So India has played around with different options. I'll walk through them. But at some point, after you know, suffering a Bombay 2008 and uh, concerns about future control of nuclear weapons, you may have to remove the shield. And so this incentive has been growing, I argue, over the last 20 years to at least think about this as a potential option. And I think that's kind of where we are, right? So there's a, this, the mechanism is not in the US case, which was extended deterrence, driving counterforce or the American way of war, right? In order to make extended deterrence credible, you might have to think about counterforce options. But the Indian case, it's about revisionism from your adversary at very low but provocative levels in your homeland at the shadow of the future, who might control the nuclear forces? Right, so everybody knows the basic strategic problem. India uh, had conventional superiority. Its mainstay conventional strategy was a strike core concept. Uh, Pakistan's development of nuclear weapons uh, basically neutralized the large strike core concept, 800,000 forces penetrating uh, the plains and desert sectors of Pakistan. Uh, and uh, the first, after Kargil, the first major provocation was the 2001 parliament attack. And we forget how provocative that may have been to Delhi because uh, at the time, you know, we, were, we had just suffered 9 11 and we were gearing up for the war in Afghanistan. We were, the United States was courting Pakistan again to prosecute that war. And on December 13th, uh, you had a group of militants believed to be from the Jaish and Muhammad, uh, sponsored and funneled from Pakistan, attacking parliament, uh, which looks like a potential decapitation strike on the BJP. I mean, this is a pretty provocative. Imagine if you know, a similar attack had been uh, perpetrated on Capitol Hill. 
And so this led to Operation Parakram. Those, of, uh, those who follow South Asia will be familiar with the 10-month military mobilization. Michael uh, and Polly Nayak have written, uh, I think, the best uh, brief on this. Was it, what's it called? The Twin Peaks Crisis? Twin Peaks Crisis. Um, which is available on the web. And it goes through just how severe a crisis this was. Right? And the lesson for India you know, after mobilizing the three strike corps after, during Parakram was wait, they didn't do it fast enough. The army took too long to mobilize and lost the window uh, to retaliate conventionally against Pakistan. That's the lesson that the army drew. And in some ways, that's not really far off the mark because it took about a month, three, to three weeks to a month, for all three strike corps to deploy before the Indian army was ready to prosecute its conventional option. That led to this idea of cold start which was debated in the think tanks. It's un we can debate ad nauseum as to whether the Indian Army uh, ever adopted more aggressive versions of cold start. But the think tank concept that took hold in the media and in Pakistani imagination was this idea of breaking up the strike corps into 10 so-called IBGs, integrated battle groups, to conduct shallow penetrations across the border. Uh, and uh, the, the, there would be, uh, it would be a shorter, intense conflict uh, the idea for the Indians would be to grab some territories, a bargaining chip, uh, to dismantle terrorist organizations, basically. Some bargaining chip idea. Uh, and you would have to, at some point, attrit the Pakistan army in order to achieve these objectives. Uh, and so uh, the myth of Cold Start, at least, because this concept was never really adopted. India still has the strike core concept, even though it's reoriented its mobilization procedure. Uh, the holding cores have become pivot cores. You can talk about what configuration may or may not exist now. Uh, but the more extreme version of Cold Start that was propagated seems to not have been adopted by the Indians. And this, you know, this came on the heels of Parakram, right? So 2004-ish is when the myth of Cold Start is born, and that gives genesis to Pakistan's tactical nuclear weapons development. So the Nasser and uh, other cruise missiles, which are shorter range, the Nasser is 60, now 70 kilometers. Uh, and the idea was, uh, you know, Cold Start gave grist to the mill here to uh, develop these tactical nuclear weapons to defeat Cold Start. What's the Pakistani line? Cold Start will end in hot war. And uh, you know this is repeated in ISPR releases all the time. right? So full spectrum deterrence takes hold after the development of Cold Start. You get the, uh, the idea is tactical nuclear weapons on Indian forces as they cross uh, into Pakistani territory. Pakistan army will stand and fight for a while. It may not be first resort, but it won't be last resort. Uh, tactical nuclear weapons uh, to defeat India's conventional attack, and then the strategic nuclear weapon, the long-range nuclear forces, to deter Indian nuclear retaliation. Right? India's doctrine is no first use, credible minimum deterrence, uh, and that worked when, India, when Pakistan only had strategic nuclear forces. You could threaten massive retaliation when they had limited strategic nuclear forces. Uh, and you could say I was, I, you know, any use of strategic nuclear weapons would result in massive strategic nuclear retaliation. Uh, the problem became with the development of tactical nuclear weapons was the threat of retaliating with seven strategic nuclear weapons against seven Pakistani cities in the event where they used a single tactical nuclear weapon on Indian forces who were operating on Pakistani soil. Credible. And so Pakistan develops this idea of full spectrum deterrence, right? And the idea is to use strategic nuclear forces to deter the Indian strategic nuclear retaliatory attack. That makes the use of tactical nuclear weapons a war-winning strategy. So we all knew the cycle, right? Terrorist attack believed to be sponsored by Pakistan. India retaliates with some version of cold start. Pakistan uses tactical nuclear weapons on Indian forces, on Indian soil, and India does not have uh, the justification for retaliating with strategic nuclear forces. Then comes the Bombay attack, 2008, right? And this really surfaced the dilemma, right? By 2008, you were supposed to have cold start intact. You were supposed to have a, con a credible, conventional, retaliatory option. And this, is, this was an outrage that was worse than the parliament attacks. 173 people killed, British citizens, American citizens, Israelis, Indians. So the dilemma is, how do you escape the paralysis of Pakistan's tactical nuclear weapons following a mass casualty provocation? After Bombay, it was clear that there was really no credible ground retaliatory option to strike back with. And uh, you know, the problem is you know, we can talk about India's ground-centric uh, options. Toby and George at Carnegie uh, have written no, Not War, Not Peace, great book, which goes through why there, there are other options, but it takes inter-service coordination to develop them. 
and India is always focused on the ground option. So the ground option, though, was, wasn't available. And so on, if your solution went to Pakistan's tactical nuclear weapons was trying to operate below the threshold, say, OK, we're going to develop a Cold Start-like strategy so we don't cross Pakistan's nuclear threshold. After the Bombay attacks, you have this problem, well, you know, and Pakistan believes that, you know, your, that threshold is too hard to fix. How do, you, how do you ensure that Indian forces stay below the threshold? How do you ensure that, you know, if Pakistan devolves tactical nuclear weapons in the crisis, that one brigadier or, uh, you know, uh, major general that has control of the system doesn't use it? How many thresholds do you have to calibrate against? And how do you stop your forces from getting drunk on success if you get going? Right? And so uh, this idea of Cold Star kind of you know, was frozen after the Bombay attacks and thereafter. Right? The conventional option is still going to be worked on, I imagine. Uh, but uh, it also meant thinking about potential adjustments to nuclear strategy. So I'll very quickly walk through the evidence um, that I presented earlier. And this is, this is not the first time, so anybody can you know, see this uh, on the web. But let's start with the holy doctrine. The 2003 official release of the doctrine, only eight bullet points. This is the only official. There's a draft nuclear doctrine of 1999, which is a long, meandering, at times inconsistent doctrine, which was uh, probably never intended to be released publicly. It was. The only official release is the actual doctrine, right? So there are three, let's call them three core pillars of the official doctrine. Credible minimum deterrence, pillar number one. Pillar number two is no first use, although it is caveated already. Uh, by bullet point six, when uh, it, India leaves open the possibility for uh, retaliating with nuclear weapons against chemical or biological use. Uh, and then the third bullet point is, and the third pillar is, the idea of massive nuclear retaliation. So this is the doctrine. In 2016, then, so we don't have official, any official updates to the doctrine since 2003. And there's very little writing by authoritative figures about the doctrine. You have some SFC commanders that write after they leave, like Admiral Vijay Shankar, uh, General B.S. Nagel. But in the Indian system, the point person is the National Security Advisor. The coordinator for all nuclear strategy forces and posture is the National Security Advisor. Uh, Brijesh Mishra was very powerful, was responsible for the release of the, uh, of the doctrine itself uh, and the standing up the Strategic Force Command. Then you had several national security advisors along the way who managed the force, and then enter Shiv Shankar Menon uh, in the early 2010s. So he, who says, first of all, that massive retaliation has to be uh, countervalued? The doctrine doesn't say that. And in response to this dilemma about having uh, limited conventional options or unattractive conventional options after a Pakistani uh, terrorist attack, Menon writes, if Pakistan were to use tactical nuclear weapons against India, even against Indian forces in Pakistan, right, so that scenario, it would effectively be opening the door to a massive Indian first strike, having crossed India's declared red lines. There would be little incentive once Pakistan had taken hostilities to the nuclear level for India to limit its response, since that would only invite further escalation by Pakistan. India would hardly risk giving Pakistan the chance to carry out a massive nuclear strike after the Indian response to Pakistan using tactical nuclear weapons. That sentence is really important. He lays out the logic for not allowing Pakistan to use its long-range strategic force if India were to retaliate with uh, you know, either proportional retaliation or strategic nuclear retaliation. In other words, Pakistani tactical nuclear weapon use would effectively free India to undertake a comprehensive first strike against Pakistan. Now, nuclear jargon, for those of us who have been studying nuclear weapons for a long time, comprehensive first strike has its a, alarm bells. It's very specific meaning. It means strategic nuclear counterforce. So one of the criticisms I got was, oh, Menon didn't really mean, he didn't know what comprehensive first strike meant. It's a pretty sophisticated national security advisor, the foreign secretary, ambassador to China. He's been studying this stuff for a long time. And even if you think that, the sentence before it is really important, right? Because he's basically laying out the logic. We would not... India would hardly risk giving Pakistan the chance to carry out a massive nuclear strike after the Indian response to Pakistan using tactical nuclear weapons. He's talking about disarming the strategic nuclear force. The Joint Doctrine Indian Armed Forces 2017, which came out after all of this, a couple of things. One, uh, you know, the responsiveness of the force we know has increased uh, over the past several years. Uh, one interesting tidbit is the Strategic Forces Command controls all of nuclear, India's nuclear warheads. Now, this could be sloppy because 
the SFC itself may still be comprised of civilian agencies, and so it's unclear whether the joint doctrine here is being is saying something new or is uh, you know kind of folding it in. But the bigger thing for me, at least, was you know this is the first official document doctrine that I know of that dropped credible minimum deterrence, and the joint doctrine itself refers to just maintain a credible deterrence. Now, this was a sloppy doctrine in a lot of ways, a lot of typos, <laughs> even in the publicly released version. But given all the kerfuffle over all of this, you know, dropping one of the pillars of the official doctrine in another official release, you know, instead of going from credible minimum deterrence to credible deterrence, has some significance if they meant it. But I'll leave that one aside. Okay, so the, the other piece of this, which is what I, I think a lot of the Indian media focused on, was, well, if you think about counterforce, you really have to think about preemption, right? Because you can't afford to go second with counterforce doctrines. You can't afford to have any of your forces attrited because your accounting and how many forces you allocate to your adversary's forces are very precise. And what Menon says about, uh, about preemption is interesting. You know, it says, okay, so there's no need to have this language or paragraph in his book if there actually wasn't a gray area. So he says, there is a potential gray area as to when India would use nuclear weapons first against another nuclear weapon state. Circumstances are conceivable in which India might find it useful to strike first, for instance, against a nuclear weapon state that it declared it would certainly use its weapons, and if India were certain that adversary's launch was imminent. But India's present public nuclear doctrine is silent on this scenario. There are two things I want to highlight here. First, this is classic defensive preemption, right? So if you think your adversary is going to go imminently, International law carves out exceptions for preemption. You could say this is defensive. The other interesting line is the last sentence. But India's present public nuclear doctrine is silent on this scenario. Now, India has done some internal review. Does this suggest that the private or classified version of the doctrine says something about preemption? There's no reason to have this in there otherwise. right? Why even flag this? Uh, the word, you know, the, the phrase "present public nuclear doctrine." Uh, if there wasn't some debate or thinking about uh, carving out an exception and making uh, nuclear weapons use preemptively against an imminent use uh, consistent with no first use, right? This is kind of basic. This is basically what the debate that China had uh, about whether preemption would still be consistent with no first use. Right, so we, we saw this thinking on preemption emerging for a while. Uh, Parikar, the, def the sitting defense minister at the time, brings it up. Uh, all of us write, look, you got to clarify this. Right? You talk about how no first use is not a, um, you know, no book is going to constrain me when uh, nation security is at stake, and I don't believe we should have uh, no first use. We have it. Doctrine hasn't changed. He was very clear to say that. Uh, but he personally didn't believe it. Well, this is a sitting defense minister, and without a clarification, all that is doing is injecting ambiguity into how flexible you think no first use is. Okay. And whether you can make preemption consistent with it, which is what Nagel tried to do in one of his earlier writings. Why would you have to think about this, though, if countervalue targeting is your mainstay strategy? Because countervalue targeting doesn't require preemption. You can have a relaxed posture. The only reason to think about it is if you think about counterforce. Right, and so the way Menon, uh, you know, pieces the, this, the, these writings together in a chapter, which is labeled, you know, why India has a no first use doctrine um, or no first use policy. Uh, if you read the chapter after reading all of this, it becomes clear to me, at least, in my interpretation. Feel free to disagree. It is not a fulsome defense of NFU as a sacrosanct policy. He says it needs to be re reviewed. It needs to be, is it in India's security interest? He goes through the history uh, and says, look, we have it because we have it, but you know, it's something in, in interviews he's given subsequently. Like, India has it. It's a pillar of Indian nuclear strategy, but it's not fixed in stone. It needs to be continuously revisited to see if it's in India's security interest. And when he has the language about the gray area, and then he talks about counterforce, the only condition under which you'd have to think about preemption, then you know this all starts adding up into thinking about flexibility of the doctrine. The only public statement that Menon gave uh, after what I call counterforce gate is that India's doctrine has far greater flexibility than it gets credit for. He's not denying that he was talking about counterforce, and you know so the the two pieces are well, is preemption consistent with no first use? Maybe, and there are arguments that you can make that it's defensive, and use against imminent use is. Uh, retaliatory first use. 
Uh, and no, nothing in the doctrine says that targeting has massive retaliation has to be countervalued. This would be a massive use of nuclear weapons when you're talking about counterforce. Uh, and so all of this suggests that at least he was thinking and wanted to put this in a published book. Why he wanted to do it, we can talk about later. I have hypotheses. I don't think we have a definitive answer. And it may be that India didn't actually adopt this. It may be that it was wishful thinking. It may be that he was opposed to it and decided to float the trial balloon to have everybody you know, come out against it. There are a lot of hypotheses, and we can talk about you know, what I think is most likely. Can India do this? Well, there are a lot of pieces. We've talked about this. Uh, I've written about this before. It's working on ISR. BrahMos is one hell of a counterforce weapon. You may not even have to put nuclear ordnance on it, but uh, it is the supersonic and hypersonic versions in joint development with the Russians uh, are uh, good for very little besides counterforce. They're very accurate, they're very fast, uh, and if you are investing this much in uh, real-time ISR, uh, highly accurate missiles, why do you need accuracy with counter-value targeting? Why are you working on MIRVs? Maybe MARVs, which are in height, height and accuracy. You can say these are you know, the criticism I always got was Agni-5 is China-specific. After the Hwasong-14 test, if anybody tells me the minimum ranges don't that constrain a state and that the Agni-5 can't be used against Pakistan, you have to give me a reason why. You can lock these trajectories. And the minimum ranges tend to be classified, but there's a rule of thumb. Uh, and on a, so the horizontal distance of the Hwasong-14 test was about 950 kilometers. The, and it was, the full range was about 9,500 kilometers, so 10%. So uh, if the minimum ranges uh, you know, go accordingly, then the Agni-5, let's call it 5,000 kilometers, your minimum range, if you loft it, you know, 500 kilometers. So all of these missiles are, you know, there's no specificity. You can't use short-range systems against long-range targets, but you can use long-range missiles against short-range targets. And it actually makes defeating BMBs easier because uh, the trajectories make it very easy for the RVs to defeat missile defenses. And India is investing in missile defenses, right? And the idea with missile defenses is if I can attrit the, let's call it, 40 or 50 long-range Pakistani strategic nuclear systems, if I have missile defenses that can pick up a couple, I don't need to get them all. I just need to shrink the strategic nuclear force by 90% maybe. I'm not saying this is a great idea. I'm just saying that the logic would be if I can you know, get 50 down to five and my missile defenses can pick up five, at least I have a massive damage limitation uh, effort. That would be at least the the the, propo the, the proponents of shifting the counterforce would make this argument. It's still a very hard problem. This is just a rough estimate. This is where Pakistan's air bases, missile garrisons, nuclear related production facilities are, etc. This is basically your minimum counterforce target set. And Chris Clary and I are working on a longer paper on this, doing the force exchange analysis. They're not going to be sitting sitting idle in a crisis, right? So these things are going to be flushed out. This is a lot of targets to hit. And you have to do it in real time, right? And the reason you have to use nuclear weapons for counterforce is your blast radius has to be bigger than your ISR uncertainty. Uh, these may be hardened. Uh, so it is conventional counterforce is something the U.S. can think about. It may not be something, if you think about counterforce, the Indians may have to rely on nuclear counterforce. But this is a hard problem set, right? So the skeptic says, look, you're talking about irradiating the state of Pakistan if you're talking about counterforce. Uh, and it's a massive nuclear strike to disarm even their strategic – even if you say, I don't care about the tactical nuclear systems because they can't range my cities, right? As a, as a civilian national security manager, you're like, the Nasser system doesn't – you know, isn't what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the Shaheens. I just need to get the Shaheens because those are the ones that hit my population centers. Even if you say, okay, that's – and prioritize those and that's a more manageable set, you still have a lot of systems to deal with. So this is the last slide. The challenges are, look, Pakistan's not going to sit idly by. This is an incentive for Pakistan to build up, build out, move things around, and you know, in some ways become a self-fulfilling prophecy. It becomes a garrison state as it becomes, has to invest so much in long-range strategic nuclear forces and move them around to ensure survivability. Really risky deployment procedures. You get into first strike instability issues. Both sides have use them or lose them pressure. So as soon as you get a crisis, it's a race to the exits. Who uses them first? Right? So whatever relaxation you had because India had a relaxed, assured retaliation, counter-value targeting strategy goes out the window. How do you reassure China? If the China thinks you're coming after their strategic nuclear forces, right? decoupling these strategies is what 
this would require, and is, can you do that? Okay, that's a, t a tough problem. Uh, and then finally, is it just India? I think no. I think, uh, let's take an example. If uh, so far the Israeli strategy has been to hit every reactor in the region that it sees and stop other states from getting nuclear weapons if they can. But if a day comes where a state in the region has nuclear, uh, acquires nuclear weapons and uses them as a shield behind which to aggress against Israel, then think for a second Israel won't be tempted by counterforce. Eliminate the shield. It's the easiest way to deal with the strategic problem because it opens up your conventional superiority again. Right? And this is the Indian aim with thinking about adding this option to the menu, which is all I'm claiming this is. Okay, so I'll stop there and I look forward to questions and discussions, but I want to reiterate that this isn't about changing Indian doctrine. Nothing in the declared nuclear doctrine needs to change for India to think about nuclear counterforce or think about adding that as one of the target sets to its uh, nuclear strategy. No first use is not going anywhere. There may be an effort to make preemption in this very limited scenario consistent with no first use, uh, but this is about adding a, uh, a targeting option to deal with a very real strategic problem that India's had, uh, and it is the, it, it, it's important to read Menon because he was a former national security advisor and managed the program for five or six years, uh, five years, and uh, but he's only one voice, right? So the caveat is, has this persisted since he left office? We don't we don't know, uh, and we have to do more legwork, and the Indians have to, you know, those who are working in the system have to come out and write and you know either rebut this or confirm it or whatever. Uh, but this is one man's view. But this is one person's view who we can't ignore. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Faroz for uh, comments and discussion, and I look forward to your questions. All right. For those of you who are wondering why I wasn't enforcing time there, let me just assure you that the credibility of the deterrence I wield is quite minimal. <laughs> <laughs> Faroz, please. Well, thank you. Thank you, Vipin, and thank you, Stinson Center, for <coughs> inviting me. Can, can you hear me? Um, is that okay? Uh, you want it is on. Uh, you know, Vipin's presentation has sort of provoked me to respond point by point, but that's going to take several hours if I do that. <laughs> I, will, I will not do that. But I think uh, it's important that at least uh, two points that he brought out in the beginning, reflecting what India's thinking is behind, if at all India's post, uh, posture or thinking is changing, I'd like to bring that on the record. The two myths, at least in Delhi, is one is, that there will be somehow a radical Islamic takeover in Pakistan, including in the military. The historical record does not suggest that, or any other polls that you take in Pakistan does not suggest that this has ever happened or likely to happen in any shape and form. So that is a myth that is actually grows in Delhi's thinking on about Islamic takeover, which will affect the command and control. And I think it's an important point for and the other thing is, and this has been written a lot here by other uh, authors as well, that asymmetric warfare is waged under the shadow of nuclear deterrence. I think that's the second myth. Asymmetric warfare in South Asia has existed from the very day India was partitioned into India and Pakistan. The very fact that Kashmir is divided today as was as a result of not regular forces, but irregular forces. And both India and Pakistan have used a strategy of softening up the other by using asymmetric forces, subconvention forces. One has failed to succeed. Oh, by the way, they used soften up and then assailed with conventional force. That was exactly the strategy that Pakistanis thought that they were good and clever to do so and they failed to do so in the 1965 war under two operations. It was the same strategy that India used in Bangladesh. Soften up for nine months and then assail. India succeeded in that. It's important to remember that this history is archived in the memory of the Pakistan security managers as they went towards their nuclear capability. And I think Eating Grass, my book, talks a lot about that. I will not say any further on that. But one thing that they existed throughout for the last 40 years, and particularly in 20 years of having demonstrated, that India and Pakistani did not believe that there will be 
a sudden bolt out of the blue strike uh, what has just been described, what we just heard. They always believe that that's unlikely to happen and there is always a pathway. And the pathway was just described by Weapon. I will not contest that pathway. Uh, whether a terrorist incident results into a conventional war. But I think I was part of the system when all these doctrinal things were evolving, so I will focus on that in a while rather than responding to Weapon. But I just want to say something from the very beginning. Uh, I'm going almost 40, 50 years back. The original thinking on Pakistan was as to why would they go nuclear was essentially to offset India's conventional superiority. And that study was pretty much mimicking from what the first offset or uh, the, uh, the Cold War in Europe uh, strategy was. Every study in Pakistan was derived from that, and that was the basis. In fact, Dulfikar Ali Bhutto, who said was the father of the Pakistan political bomb, had that idea in the mind. And ironically, it was the Pakistan military at the time that was saying they need conventional weapons to fight, not nuclear weapons. So the Pakistani dilemma from the very beginning was, how do you actually replace conventional defense weakness with nuclear weapons? That, is, that, that looks theoretically very easy, but practically, that's a very big challenge. I think Neil Jock, in one of the studies, even before India-Pakistan conducted the test, concluded that nuclear weapons do not replace conventional defense weakness. So that is where the Pakistani dilemma begins when they demonstrated the deterrence, not necessarily to, to deter India's nuclear, own, uh, nuclear um, attack only, but also how to defend. That's the main, main challenge of Pakistan. And as India's doctrine evolved, as just explained by a weapon, the Pakistani challenge continues to compound. So it would be very really easy for me to say about the Pakistani doctrine that nothing has changed about Pakistan doctrine. And um, when I was preparing some of the notes, I came across a, one of a, a very important essay written by uh, a colleague by the name of Sadia Taslim in, 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 in Carnegie, Con Carnegie uh, publication by Ashley Taleb. In fact, she captures a lot of Pakistani's current thinking with the spectrum of interviews that she did that captures what is Pakistan, what is changing in Pakistan. Uh, there are some constant in Pakistan that is unlikely to change, and I'd like to just comment on that, why that is the case. The first constant is that Pakistan will never declare that it's going to use nuclear weapons, which means that they, they will never have an officially declared doctrine. It's almost like a dogma for them not to declare that. And for that reason alone, the analysis that supported Britain's argument is seldom in Pakistan because these things do not come out in Pakistan. Neither an official uh, nuclear posture review or that kind comes out, nor the analysis comes out from the think tanks from Islamabad the way you described. They don't write that way. And if at all they write, they justify why they are doing rather than analyzing deeply about stability, instability, and challenges to, to, to the command system. I will try to unfold what challenges the Pakistanis are facing. So I was mentioning about Saudia. Saudia mentioned what constant was. This was one constant. But then there are certain other changing things that are happening, which she, the trends that she mentioned, and I also observe trends separately from other sources and other uh, uh, research that we do at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, so those trend lines are that the, and I'm using Saudia's word, that she's the Pakistanis are moving from a simple, existential deterrence model to a more complex deterrence model. And that complex deterrence model that she describes doesn't describe much in detail except to say that the suite of delivery means and the diversity of systems that has been, and uh, Vipin describes some of them, I'll not go over again, except that he did not mention the Pakistani cruise vessels uh, that is also part of the Pakistani arsenal. And that is a very important component of defeating a large number of things that India is doing uh, Pakistani cruise vessels. But again, uh, lately this year, the Pakistan introduced two more elements in their arsenals. One was MIRV test, and the other was sea-based strategic deterrence. And that's a new dimension that is added to the Pakistani thinking, not just tactical nuclear weapons. And each one of them have implications on their thinking. So if there is a suite of delivery means that is now 
in physically the Pakistani arsenal, is their thinking in the doctrinal changes? Well, the answer is probably, but it is, you can, you can pick up trends as to the practice that would happen, but rather than uh, you know, any declarative position that would come out. So the trend number one is that the, the Pakistanis are now maybe thinking in terms of everything that you heard from Bipin. By the way, when Bipin, you made this statement uh, in, uh, in Carnegie Conference, you probably visited India, I visited Pakistan a, a while back. And the reaction in Islamabad was, there's nothing new that Bipin has said that we didn't know earlier. Which is an indication that the Pakistanis were always dismissive of the credibility of Indian military doctrine in the first place. So if there are changes on counter force targeting, that is what is the premise, which they will not say it openly, but that's the premise on which they already work on. So that trend line would mean that sooner or later, and there are voices in Islamabad and, and other think tanks in Islamabad they talk about, and retired bureaucrats talking about, that it's about time that this recess deterrence mode in Pakistan is no longer going to, it's, good, it's getting too dangerous as technological maturation, space-based assets that Bipin described, that will be too vulnerable. Therefore, the state of readiness from unmated to mated and maybe even high alert or hair trigger environment could well be in the interest of Pakistan to deter any adventurism in India. Weapon talked about the Pakistani prospects of uh, uh, radical takeover, but if you talk to average person in Islamabad, they believe that a radical takeover in, in India has already taken place. It is not the nature of sophisticated diplomats talking like, like uh, Sheikh Shankar Menon and others, but it is the nature of regime that is in Delhi which is a fusion of strange ideology and very aggressive nationalism, where a democratic India could do exactly what Bipin is describing. And therefore, that might lead Pakistan to be thinking differently about the posture in peacetime. So that is the one major trend that I believe is changing. And obviously, Bipin, you already brought this out. The other trend was to uh, target everything which is within their range that Pakistan believes uh, can, they can reach. Uh, the longest they have demonstrated so far is Shaheen 3, which is 2,750 kilometers. And the explanation given here in this town was that this is to target Andaman and Nicobar Island. And their justification was that we would deny India a second strike option. That's how it was described here. Uh, a land-based system going all over and a targeting an island on the Bay of Bengal to deny that you can leave your own conclusion. The other thing is the shorter range to introduce Kassar, which Bipin, you've already described, I will not go much into <coughs> detail. But the introduction of sea-based deterrence and Nasser implies that Pakistani centralized control will have to change at some point or the other. And what are the implications of the command and control then? So how much time do I have, have, to, have to say a few more things? So let me say a few more things that I believe that I would have said what is changing so on in terms of uh, uh, the complex deterrence environment. In my view, the character of warfare has changed in the region. There's a lot of debate that goes on in Washington about first offset, second offset, third offset. And when you see that debate and you apply that to the region in South Asia, you come out from some very, very difficult and some scary sort of a scenario in that, in that part. So let me say that what are the four major changes that are affecting thinking in the region, and that is, that is there. First change is in the actors, and I think Bipin has described that how the violent non-state actors are operating in the region that can bring two nuclear armed powers to war on their own timing and, and, choose, and, and choosing of their own timing. That is the most dangerous pathway, and especially if the belief in New Delhi is that any incident that happened is essentially sponsored by the nuclear armed neighbor. So, and they believe that is the case. So that is the first change that is going to change. Second is the methodology. And that methodological change is what undercuts the classic deterrence as we had learned in the 20th century. I think there are other studies that talk about second nuclear age. Today, we are living in the age of hybridity often called gray zone. Ajit Doval calls it fourth generation warfare. The 
thinking inside Pakistan security establishments and other think tanks that I interact with, the hybrid warfare India has already waged on Pakistan. In fact, in fact, both countries are engaged in that kind of hybrid warfare. And if you really go down deep history, they've probably been doing to each other throughout their history anyway. So that is the second change where the classic deterrence may not work. The third change is, is the environment. These security things are not no longer going to be in borders areas, as Vipin has described. I think that with all the things that are happening, the classic border war at the land may well be stabilized because of a wide variety of reasons that, that was described by you. In fact, the war is going into peripheral spaces. And that peripheral spaces include particularly the maritime space as well. Our study at the NTS indicates that the land warfare is, they, it, prices may start on the land, but it might move to sea. And with sea-based deterrence that has been introduced by both countries now, this is going to have a very different implication about first strike and second strike. I can answer more on the Q&A session. And finally, the most important is the technological and information age maturation that are happening. And that is where the suite of systems, and that is where India has an advantage over Pakistan. And therefore, if Pakistanis are using that strategy to the extent that India is also doing the same, to me, it seems that the Indian and Pakistanis are actually living in the third, in, this, in the era of a third offset stage, but the strategy and their mindset is still in the first offset. They are now acquiring those technology that was acquired in the, in the Western world in the 70s. They are now reaching that area now, whereas the information age has advanced so much. So this is the dichotomy where they actually live. And within the, and this is where something is going to go wrong in the future. I can answer more on the Q&A session. I think I'll stop here. Okay. Over to Michael. Escalation of the 
waste of technology. You would think that as nuclear capabilities grow, as stockpile size grows, as targeting lists grow, that one would embrace or at least accept the notion of vulnerability that lies at the heart, mutual vulnerability, that, as Vipin said, lies at the heart of deterrence stability or strategic stability. I think there's a lot to the writing of Brendan and Austin, and I urge you to look up that writing. We call them the counterforce cowboys. The counterforce cowboys. <laughs> I think they're right that the United States, the Soviet Union, back in the day, the United States, the Russian Federation today, didn't reach these logical conclusions of accepting mutual vulnerability. Instead, it is the nature of the addiction to nuclear weapons to seek advantage and to seek being placed at a disadvantage and to continue to pursue the dream the fantasy of damage limitation, the fantasy of escape. And if you're going to go down the rabbit hole of seeking escape from deterrence, then you can only go to preemption in a big way. And Austin and Brendan are right that these theoretical constructs of deterrence stability, strategic stability, crisis stability, arms race stability, the liturgy that we learned when we were studying arms control back in the day, that these abstract concepts were defeated by the pursuit of advantage and by seeking to avoid disadvantage, seeking escape. And so as every additional warhead came online, as every additional tiny improvement in accuracy and ISR, when all of this happened, evolved, improved, we and Moscow just kept going. And it took two presidents who were not enthralled to the political and military utility of nuclear weapons to pull the plug on these dynamics. But we're back now. These instincts are so inculcated. The eggheads, the whiz kids, the IR theorists, the arms controllers who devise these useful concepts of deterrence stability, strategic stability, arms race stability, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't make the decisions when it came to strategic modernization programs. They didn't make decisions with respect to warhead accuracies and numbers. And they sure as hell didn't get in the room when the PSYOP was pulled together. They never did. 
So let's not blame the arms controllers for the failure of constructs they didn't have a chance to implement. I take issue, Brendan and Austin, on that. Because that's my inference from their writing. Can we escape the same dynamic on a smaller scale in southern Asia? Or will China, India, and Pakistan follow the, the same sad and senseless progression of a nuclear competition as did we in Moscow? Make no mistake, we are here talking about this at the right time because China and India and Pakistan are on the cusp of their own counterforce compulsion. It's, it's happening now. And the counterforce compulsion can lead to the damage limitation compulsion. If China and India head down this rabbit hole, they will have learned nothing from Washington and Moscow. Or they will have learned the wrong things from Washington and Moscow. I am still counting on New Delhi and Beijing being smarter than that, smarter than we were, smarter than Moscow is. If I'm wrong, then one key factor of restraint in the second nuclear age will go by the boards. We have not recognized how fortunate we have been so far that Beijing and New Delhi think or have thought that this whole nuclear competition business of the first nuclear age was crazy, wasteful, stupid. That's where they've been. I'm counting on the continuation of cautious civilian leadership in Beijing and New Delhi. A civilian leadership that has heretofore not been in thrall to nuclear weapons. I'm still counting on the inertia of India in this respect. Um, I will grant you that Pakistan is more susceptible to the counterforce compulsion than either India or China. Raul Pindi has already defined, as has been said, requirements for full spectrum deterrence to include counterforce targeting at both the low end of the range scale and the high end of the range scale. Raul Pindi borrows heavily, too heavily, on US nu nuclear war fighting If it draws from old US Army field manuals on tactical nuclear weapons, will it also draw on US plans for targeting longer range missiles? And we know in Pakistan, Raul Pindi decides, the civilian salute, totally different than Beijing and China. Still. Pakistan faces, and Feroz, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Pakistan faces significant constraints on how far it will go down this rabbit hole. No ISR to speak of. A really lagging space program. 
it will need lots of help from Beijing if it goes down this rabbit hole. And if China supports Pakistan's need for real-time targeting, that's a whole new ball game. It's possible. There are fissile material and financial constraints to the Pakistani nuclear program, as robust as it is. And counterforce targeting, successful counterforce targeting, depends on India, India's leaders being totally asleep at the switch. You can't discount that. But still, you got to believe that New Delhi, while being slow off the mark, will take steps to foil preemption. So, for all these reasons, I still maintain there are reasons for cautious optimism. I know there's signals. Vipin is very right to call our attention to them. But I maintain there are reasons for cautious optimism. Although I will grant that optimistic appraisals of nuclear restraint in 1998 didn't turn out so well. And they may not turn out so well now. And lastly, I will also grant that Menon's book stokes these fires. You have to believe that Rawalpindi has memorized the passages that Vipin has put on So, we're really at an important point here. Okay. Well, we've got a lot of provocations on the table, and we have about 20 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, so, let's keep this disciplined. Uh, please wait for the mic, uh, and then introduce yourself, and then pose your question in the form of a question, and keep it succinct. And uh, depending on how, how much enthusiasm is here, we'll try to maybe bundle some questions together to, to get a chance for all the speakers to respond. So with that, have at it. OK, I see this gentleman here, and then we'll go there afterwards. Why don't we go to this one first? Yeah. Uh, thank you all for being here. Atib Khan from Duke University. Uh, my question is about compellents. And the, I mean, forgive me, but I think we've spent a lot of time today discussing the size of the powder keg and the the worries of what will happen when the powder keg explodes. But my question is, I guess, about the relationship between the powder keg and the spark, in the sense that uh, Mr. Narang or Dr. Narang, you've outlined how the change in nuclear doctrine may be in response or maybe in response to security threats for India. But I, my question then is, how, how does the change in doctrine impact like internal Pakistani policy? And then I guess the question for you, General, is then how is if and if if in any way at all possible, does the change in nuclear doctrine actually require Pakistan to change its internal calculus when it comes to internal terror threats? Thank you. Gentlemen, back. Uh, Guy Thomas, I, I've been involved in a, in ISR since 1968. Uh, I was a, a space specialist in the Navy. Before that, manned reconnaissance person. I uh, started in. Um, in the space business in the mid 80s at the classified level. Uh, I was one of the people that, that wrote what our most vulnerabilities were to maritime terrorism at the direction of the president and what we could do about it. And that led me to commercial space and what's happened there. Uh, but we, but you gentlemen have just referred to the ISR problem as being crucial. And uh, you, sir, said that, uh, that China was going to have to help India. Uh, there are something like 300 uh, satellites today with Earth observation capabilities in orbit today. Uh, within the next five years, there's going to be 1,000. 
all you have to do is write a check for. And uh, I was just talking to the CEOs of both Planet and another company that asked me not to d divulge this, uh, but they're looking at cross-queuing this so that they're going to be able to take a picture and get it to you if you write the check, that's all you got to do, uh, within an hour uh, at less than a meter resolution. That's going to be a major change in this situation here, folks, in the, yeah. in the counter farce problem. It's also going to be a change on the, on the maritime world, and uh, I'm trying to put that under control and in some perspective in my writings. But counterforce is going to be a viable thing from commercial space <coughs> in all of our lifetimes. Why don't we uh, go down the line? Yeah, let's do two. Depends on shutter control. And <coughs> to be determined. So if there is no shutter control, do you know what I mean by shutter control? So if there's a big crisis somewhere in the world, the United States up till now has, can override checkbooks. We have relationships with the companies and we can say no pictures to anybody except us. I'm simplifying. But a lot depends on shutter control. As more companies come online, if there is shutter control, the workaround for Pakistan is China. How doctrine might affect Pakistan policy or on ISR, like ISR? Yeah, I mean, the question that you raised, and both questions relate to that. So I think, Michael, you were right by pointing out that one of the weak link of Pakistanis uh, would be the ISR, the space. And uh, one thing, uh, uh, Vipin, correct me on one another aspect. The other authors in India have written that India's changing doctrine is trying to look at having a different doctrine with China and a different one with Pakistan. That was my my inference. If you're shifting to, uh, I mean, the doctrine is uniform, right? The issue is, as Menon stated, the doctrine is gets is more flexible than it gets credit for. So you can have a different strategy towards China than you have towards Pakistan under the umbrella of the same doctrine. So my point was about strategic nuclear strategy being decoupled between the two or delinked. Decoupling is not a yeah. So right. I mean, if you're sitting in Islamabad or Pakistan, you're looking at this decoupling of the strategy, and you're seeing your own weaknesses there. And I did mention that if there is any thinking in Pakistan, I don't see that happening now, but since this was alluded to, quoting many authors in Pakistan, that they may change from this recessed, blade back posture towards more hair trigger. In the absence of ISR, this is going to be a very problematic thing, because that brings the question that you have raised. Because if you are changing the peacetime posture into a crisis mode, and as Vipin said, this would mean dispersal. This would mean getting into a sort of a more ready-to-go state. That means that the safety coefficient will have to be reduced in favor of battle effectiveness. And that, that transition from peacetime safety to battle effectiveness, that transition is, is, will depend on technological assistance from across. And if everything that Michael just, you have said, the Pakistanis have you know, no, nowhere else to go. So, Although I have no knowledge about what's the nature of China-Pakistan cooperation, but I would assume that if India, if China and Pakistan both believe that a rising India is threat to both of them, they have every reason it incentivizes China to help Pakistan in that posture. Let India deal with Pakistan first rather than trying to deal with China. So here you have a triangular problem in that case. Um, sir, thank you for your, observ your your point. I think it's absolutely right, and it gets to the fundamental shift that I think is happening, it's getting cheaper for nation states, right? So you have all these commercial satellite companies like Planet Labs, but this is not beyond the means of a country like India to have persistent surveillance over Pakistan, small territory, especially the land-based systems, limited number of sites, they've been watching them for 15 years, uh, and it's, you know, the the other half of the counterpo counterforce cowboys are Daryl Press and Kier Lieber, uh, uh, you know, all big part of the MIT family. The uh, their their 
focuses on the accuracy revolution, and they've uh, correctly pointed that out. They've also talked about the ISR revolution, and I think that's understated. I think the ISR revolution is real, and that is the fundamental, I think, uh, bottleneck when you think about counterforce strategies, right? Because if you can't find them in real time at a crisis, then game over, right? Then you're, you're just talking about putting so many you know, taps on everything to try and hit you know, the strategic nuclear forces that it becomes kind of prohibitive. But if you have good ISR, and if a commercial satellite company can do it, certainly a country like India can do it, uh, it's just getting cheaper. And it makes it more, the, it, it, it lowers the cost. And nice segue to uh, the gentleman's first point, the incentive for India has risen. Uh, and Feroz made the point that asymmetric warfare has been part of South Asia for a long time. True, but the nature of asymmetric warfare, as far as India is concerned, has amplified to an intensity level that for both domestic political reasons and no nation state can tolerate how many bomb bays in a decade, right? I mean, if my line is always if the United States had suffered Bombay, we would have ended a state, right? And India took it and behaved in a restrained manner. And I think that gave rise to this thinking about, well, we don't have the, you know, the conventional option is riddled with a lot of strategic problems, organizational problems. You just don't know where it's going to end up. And I think, you know, the Indian Express article uh, a couple of years after, maybe the year after the Bombay attack, uh, recounted some of the CCS, um, the CCS meeting minutes. And the point was, you know, Prime Minister Ramon Singh said, well, if I, st if I start this thing, where does it end? Uh, and that's a question no no one can answer and no civilian wants to really think about. So the idea that India might be pushed into thinking about adding this strategic option to its nuclear strategy isn't that insane. I mean, it's what else are you going to do as a nation state? You don't have a, uh, uh, your, your conventional military option uh, has all of these problems. Your traditional counter value strategic targeting doesn't deter Pakistan from doing this. This might if you think you can shake Pakistan out of complacency and they worry about losing the shield behind which they're aggressing. And I do think that that security pressure combined with the domestic political com com uh, compulsions in India uh, gave rise to this thinking about, well, what else can we do? And you know, as Michael said, there are models out there. And the US never walked away from counterforce. There's a myth that we walked away from it, maybe for a brief period. We always thought about counterforce. Uh, and when the costs are falling to the point where uh, you can think about it, and like I said, Pakistan has tens of strategic weapons and not tens of thousands. This is where like the small numbers actually work in a counterforcer's favor. Uh, it's, it's not a prohibitive problem at the moment, especially for the land-based systems. We didn't talk about the sea-based systems. You know, and so one of the, one of the counter arguments is, well, when Pakistan goes to sea, there's their second strike, you know, their survivable second strike capability. I'm not so sure that's true. I mean, we got pretty good at hunting Soviet boomers as, uh, Brendan and Austin pointed out, and India's ASW is pretty good, and their limited number of ports, they don't have the sea board that uh, you know, the Soviet Union does. And Chris Clary and Ankit Panda have a piece coming out in the Washington Quarterly on this, uh, the move to sea and how survivable these systems are going to be. And I don't think we should take it for granted that sea-based systems guarantee survivability. And that's uh, actually in a Simpson event we had maybe two months that's ago. Right. Chris, there's a transcript of, of Chris's discussion on some of the risks of Pakistan going, going to sea with nuclear weapons. Right. Uh, so let's uh, go here, here, and then over here. So why don't we start with this woman in the back here? Samir in the back behind you. Yep. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Lydia Walker, uh, graduate student in the Harvard History Department. Uh, my question is for Vipin. If you would speculate a bit about what you think Shevchenko Menin is doing right now with this kind of strategic ambiguity. Um, what do you think he might be signaling and to which audience and why now and why this or not in the last two years and why is this about today and last year or is this about um, more his time um, as NSA? Can I, should we, should we? Well, let's, let's okay. get it together because okay. we're running out of time. So this gentleman here. Uh, Steve Winters, independent consultant. I, I, I c could you comment on how what your assessment is of the chance of a total accident or misreading of you know intelligence or so forth and so on would lead to a nuclear exchange in proportion to the chances it was an adventurous act by one party or the other or an attempt to first strike? And certainly, uh, I'm, you would probably agree at least that with the move toward counterforce and so forth and so on, 
the possibility of misinterpreting something and an accidental exchange is actually exponentially increasing. Great. And then someone here? Oh, Ronnie. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hi, Ronnie Mullen, called to William & Mary. I was wondering if both you, Vipin, and uh, General Khan could comment on the, the issue or, or of the impact of government or indeed regime stability, instability, on the evolution of this doctrine. I will grant you there is a more radical regime, uh, if you want to call it that, or government in, in power in, in Delhi, but surely it's much more stable also than what's happening in Pakistan these days. And I think going forward, um, Shivshankar Menon, you know, previous regime, previous government, what does the, uh, the sort of domestic majority of the BJ government under Modi and the wins they've had in local elections mean going forward, uh, you know, in terms of being able to plan uh, a strategy? Why don't we start with Burroughs first, and then we'll go Vip and then. Okay, let me, let me answer your question. I think you, you have a point here. I mean, India has a, this consistent democracy, and the system is not going to, to derail. Uh, this is new in Pakistan, that this is democracy is evolving now in Pakistan for the last, you know, a decade or so. So the, in the previous one, the likelihood of any instability of the military takeover happened. But I can say on record now that the likelihood of a military takeover in Pakistan is very remote now, given this, the changes that is happening in Pakistan. It will be a very huge surprise to everyone if that happens. So this messy political instability in Pakistan, in my view, may be temporarily sort of uh, upsetting. But as President Obama says, democracy is messy. So they have to go through this messy process in order to become that. And even if there is a political change in Pakistan, which is quite likely could it happen, I think there will be a, a change in civilian leadership. The military is not intervening at all in that sense. The system in Pakistan, what Vipin alluded to, was that it is militarily controlled, and Michael also said that. I'll concede that, which is there is consensus within Pakistan that that's a good, good system at the moment. This is best for the country that it remains the way the system is functioning. It's a very functioning system, and that should not be tempered with because of the political instability of this. Was there another question about that? There was a question on uh, misleading of intelligence or? Yes, uh, I, think, I think you're yeah. right. I think my, my, my answer to your question would be that India and Pakistanis are, this is like good news. I am very confident that the Indian or the Pakistani military leadership will not engage in a deliberate nuclear war. They will most likely blunder into a nuclear war for the reason that you mentioned. And that relates to the question of ISR that, you know, sometimes uh, maybe ISR is a blessing in disguise because the other party doesn't know much what's going on. But at the same time, you know, in the absence of real-time intelligence, you could overread and do something more. Uh, my concern is because I mentioned that if the weapons are out from the peacetime storage and flushed out into the system, Bad news. that is not a good news because then you have a very different regime of safety, security, and command control system. That pathway is a dangerous one. That's where mistakes are likely to happen. So, and I've written extensively on this. And an inadvertent war in South Asia is more likely than a deliberate one. So, Vipin, you've got Menon's intent, and yep. then you can also comment on these other ones. Lydia, great question. I don't know the answer to why he, why Ambassador Menon chose this particular vehicle uh, to, I think, write about and lay out the logic of, you know, and sometimes, you know, one, one point is it's in this flow of, the, there was this rise, and I talk about this because of time considerations. In the early, in the late 2000s, early 2010s, there was a rise of what was called tit for tat thinking and proportional retaliation. So he spent some time dismissing it. I said, what does proportional retaliation mean? And then he drops in this argument about counterforce. Uh, and so the, I know the draft of the book was written in early 2016. Uh, and he was actually a fellow in Cambridge at the time, and so, you know, we we, we chatted about it. But it, it, I don't think it hit me until I read the book. Um, and so it wasn't in response to Uri. It wasn't in response. So this all predated that. I think this was, this is a long-term, deep structural problem that his national security advisor he identified, 
And I think all the I think the point and the way to read it is this isn't chucking everything else out the window. It's about creating options. Options, more options are better for civilian leaders when, well, uh, to a limit, you know, depending on how many options a uh, civilian leader can handle at a time. But if there's, you know, having this option on the menu in the event it's necessary is not a bad thing, right? And uh, he lays out why they arrived here, given the history since 1998. And I think the audience was uh, largely Pakistan, because I think that there was a belief in Delhi that Pakistan had gotten really complacent. Tactical nuclear weapons, war winning, game over, you got no response. Cold start, look after Bombay, you did nothing. And I think that really uh, uh, graded in Indian strategic circles. And so what's left? Yes, you're going to work on the conventional piece. Don't think that they've abandoned some version of cold start or other standoff options. You got to push on that door. But you can also push on this door. And I think that this is just you know dropping out there that, yo, we are also, I don't think you would say yo. Um, but Back on the you know, West Coast. You know, don't think that we're not, we, we don't have you know, other options in our nuclear strategic portfolio uh, that can be an answer to what you think is a, now a war-winning strategy. And I think uh, you know, there are a lot of questions about why he did it, um, who the audience was. That's my hypothesis. Uh, but it's just my hypothesis, and I'm open to, to quite a few. But it was deliberate, and it's in a published book, right? So this isn't this is for everyone to read. Uh, and as I said, it's not my fault other people didn't read it earlier. <laughs> I mean, it was a couple months, and like, you know, it did take me two or three times to read it and get it carefully too, because you, you know, the language is very precise, but it's very easy to gloss over if you're not familiar with it. Uh, and I think the point that uh, Michael made, I think there was a probably if his intent was to shake Pakistan, Raul Pindi knows what this means. SPD knows what, you know. Uh, Comprehensive first strike means, and so they would know. But you know, maybe it was it was it was done in a somewhat subtle fashion, until you know it, it kind of uh, until analysts and scholars picked it up. Um, the the risks, I think, for Rose's point of in a, of if Pakistan goes to a peacetime deployment procedure, like he he indicates that they're already thinking about, I do worry about inadvertence. I do worry about uh, you know the accidental or theft. Uh, and that's something really to watch out for because I do think they use controls in the Pakistani system um, tend to fail lethal, not fail safe for a, a lot of reasons. Uh, and so that's something I think that would greatly sharpen the risk of uh, nuclear use uh, on the Pakistani side. I think the Indian system is still probably more relaxed during peacetime. Ronnie's question, excellent. Um, I do think, and this gets to Feroz's point that he made earlier, it is perhaps true that uh, radical takeover of either a civilian government or the military in Pakistan is a six or ten sigma event, but we've seen six and ten sigma events before. And so if you're a national security advisor, you can't dismiss the possibility that you may need one day need to do this because the control of your adversary's strategic nuclear forces uh, are no longer predictable. Uh, and I do think that that is something that is perfectly reasonable for the Indian state to worry about and plan for. Um, but it does potentially come with some risk because it pushes Pakistan into doing things that may make it more likely to. So there is a risk and a, a trade-off. Uh, but I, you know, when I was in Delhi, I heard, I heard this several times. And uh, you know, at least if you're laying out a strategic logic for why you would think about it, this plus the domestic political pressure of how many bomb days can you take before you say, look, I got to get, you know, they got to get rid of the shield. Uh, you know, I think on the Pakistani side, that that's something the Indians worry about. And I don't have a good answer to you on this. Frozen, a quick clarification, then Michael will wrap it up. Yeah, my, my clarification is that I'm not advocating or suggesting that the Pakistanis are actually doing towards a hair alert environment. I'm only suggesting that if that moves in that direction, there's no such indication as of now. But that direction, if they move, move towards a hair trigger or flush out from the peacetime change to a crisis mode, will only happen not because of statements or publications in India, but actually watching what India actually does. So it is an action that they would be looking more rather than simple writing or statements. So just wanted to clarify that it is not as bad as it might look. But if it goes in that direction, then what Bipin and I are saying is where inadvertence opens up. Oh, and uh, actually, one footnote uh, to Ronnie's question. We don't know whether this thinking is persisted in, in the current BJP government, right? So uh, Ajit Doval would be 
the point person on nuclear strategy. And there is a person in the NSCS, or was at least, uh, charged uh, with uh, targeting and uh, force posture and planning. And he was a holdover from Shevchenko Menem, but has recently left the system. But we don't know, right? And so this is the, the point you know, to Lydia and you also is that this is what Menem thought. It was probably his thinking either when he was in the system, maybe afterwards. Maybe it was you know, post hoc. He said, I, we really should have done this. And you know, I, I wish we had done this when I was national security. <coughs> don't know even the answer to that uh, publicly. And uh, what we really don't know is whether this is, this, whatever momentum may have been created or whatever thinking may have taken hold uh, continued after he left office. I just want to make sure that that's clear. Michael. Miscalculation is South Asia's middle name. Uh, we're talking here about two countries. They have fought each other. Uh, and you could make the argument that in every case of kinetic engagement on a serious level, the country that has initiated it has been unpleasantly surprised by the result. So this isn't a good track record uh, for stabilizing Well, we've run out of time. Uh, I know there are a lot of questions. You can feel free to talk to the speakers afterwards. Uh, I just want to mention that next week, next Thursday, we'll be hosting a number of scholars here to talk about some of the domestic political evolutions that are taking place within India and Pakistan and those implications, particularly for foreign policy and national security. Uh, and then I want to thank our speakers for, for joining us today, for flying out here to make this happen, and for all of you for joining us. Uh, and stay tuned for a transcript for those of you who want to follow back on some of the discussions here today. Thanks a lot.